Hello, hello, and welcome to our Tech Expressionism virtual salon here on September 28th, 2021. I do not actually recall what number this is, but it's like almost 30. <laughs> I think it's like 28 or so, 29? They're about 27. 27. Sure. Okay. Close, close, close. But anyway, um, today is going to be a very interesting day because I'm actually presenting today, which is something I haven't done in seven months. And that presentation was like maybe five minutes. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot that has happened, a lot that has changed, um, a lot that I've worked on just since joining the movement, which I'll get into. But um, joining me as a presenter is Holly Gordon, who is one of uh, a very enthusiastic uh, member of the Text Freshness Movement who has been very eager to spread the word about what we're doing and what the community is about and glad to be presenting glad with her as well. Her as well. Also, oops. Also, oops. there we go. And um, yeah, so if you are here for the first time or if this is your first salon, our general format is going to be, you know, we have our presenters, which includes me this time around, usually have two presenters give a presentation for about 30 minutes each. Um, after each presentation, there's going to be a 15 minutes or so QA session, um, which sometimes things run over, it happens, um, but we generally aim for about 45 minutes per presenter um, between the presentation and the Q&A session. Um, and then after that, it's kind of just a general discussion where we either circle back to a presentation or, um, uh, just general conversation, really. <laughs> but um, before we get started, I would like to say that um, during the presentations, please do have your mics muted. Um, you may actually ask questions in the chat. I will get to them. Um, I will actually see your questions in the chat. And afterwards, you could also raise your hand if you actually want to speak your questions instead. But please hold your like actual auditory comments till after the presentations. Um, but yeah, um, that being said, again, glad to see all of you here. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started if that's cool with everyone. And I think Holly, you want, you, would you like to go first? You're good? I'm good. All right, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, years ago, I've been using technology since into the 1990s. And years ago, I noticed an article in the newspaper about a Pinkham Rider exhibit. And I was so taken by this statement that he had made about seeing an inchworm dangling in the air with no platform. And for 20 some years, I have been dangling. And now we're all dangling together. And that's what makes, and that's what makes a movement. And the other thing that has stricken me and that has stayed with me for all of these years is a statement that Alfred Stieglitz made in 1934. I read it for the second time, and that's when it really impacted when I was in Giverny for my second visit. And he said, in 1934, he said this, there are two kinds of photographers. There are the straight shooters and there are the manipulators. And whichever photographer you are, I say, go for it for all it's worth and break the rules if you have to, just do it. And I didn't realize at the time that I really was straddling both roads. So my slide talk will presentation will give you a little idea of this evolution that I have been on since the late 1990s. So, are you gonna share the screen with me so I can bring it up? Yeah, you should actually have the ability to share your screen on your end. Oh, okay. 
there we go. All right, here we go. I'm going to take you on the ride of a lifetime. Oh, one thing to note um, with um, sharing presentations is that the audio is kind of low um, from the uh, from the presentation itself. The way I used to paint in layers, people like labels, but this is too new. It is creativity in transition with no accurate vocabulary. It is liminal, and because the camera is my medium. I call my work photo liminalism, kind of like the initial response that impressionist artists received when the establishment first saw their paintings. My art is innovative and moving photography beyond that which we know. Okay, so I know it's a bit of a hyperbole, but I like to say that I was born with a camera and it was a very painful labor for my mother, but the camera has always been an integral part of me, at least from the age of five. And maybe when I was a baby in the crib and I smelled the chemicals when my dad was processing film that he took that he developed uh maybe it just osmosed into my being i don't know but i've always been pushing boundaries and in 1990 these were two self portraits that i created i pushed 1600 film to 3200 to create my kodak smile and running as fast as i can and i'm still doing it so I've done everything with my camera, uh, shooting documentary in nature, but it has always been with a very intimate and personal focus. And it was a surprise to me to find out that the Galapagos organization wanted my work for their annual report in 2002. And then Kodak made me a professional partner in the early 2000s, I'd been to Antarctica in 1999 to 2000 because I wanted to be in unusual location when the calendar switched into the new millennium. And it was extraordinary. It was the it was the penguins that originally drove me to Antarctica, well, really sailed me to Antarctica, but it was the color and light of the ice scape that actually blew me away. And everything that I shot was with film. I only had 40 rolls and most of them were chromes and they had to be turned into internegatives. And my master printer who was processing everything for me, he had everything printed on Kodak Metallic and was so taken by how they looked that he brought them up to Kodak and Kodak made me a professional partner on the spot. And here I'm thinking, I have got it made. And now look what's happened to Kodak. But just to give you an idea, back to Stieglitz and his whole viewpoint of being a straight shooter or a manipulator, on the trip in the Falklands, I photographed this street scene because I was so taken by the textures of the buildings. And when I returned home, I used Photoshop. This is probably my first direct technological creation. I wanted that image 
to be more than what it was. So I got rid of things that I felt was superfluous. And then I added my color and my texture to emphasize what I wanted to create. Oops. Okay, so now, okay, so here in this image, I used Photoshop to create layers. And a few week, a few salons ago, somebody had mentioned, oh, we haven't talked about layers. And when I heard that, I thought, oh boy, I am gonna talk about layers. I took several photographs of this particular image. Only I selectively chose my focus to blur out because I like to make color kind of smush together. I deal with the elements of art rather than the nouns of what it is that I'm shooting. So I wasn't photographing flowers and shrubbery and so forth. I was photographing color and shape and light and pattern. And I wound up taking the digital files that I had and I layered them to create this image. So that is an early use of technology. And here's another one. This was a very interesting learning experience because I started to build a black box out of foam core in which to place this arrangement. And then I thought to myself, I don't need to do that. I can make it all black and white in Photoshop. So I did. It's cameras are can be very technological. They are tools that we can choose to use and control and not have the algorithms of the devices control us and the image that it's going to create it. I'm a control freak. So I've always controlled my camera to capture and create what it was that I wanted what I was looking at to evoke. So I wind up going to probably I'd call it my spiritual center, my spiritual core, Giverny, and here I am on the bridge in Monet's garden. You can't see the tears dripping down because I was just so taken by being there the, my very first time. And I've been there four times spending a week each visit in, in, the, actual, in the actual village of Giverny and going into the garden at seven o'clock in the morning with the gardeners to have it all to myself to just revel in it. I wasn't happy with how the wisteria looked. It was so pale, but just wait. Okay, so on this first visit, it was all rainy and windy and the garden was a mess. It was just a disaster. So I set my camera on my tripod for long exposures and I took several images and then when I got back home to my computer, to my digital dark room, I was able to layer and layer and create this image. Uh, I also discovered when I was first photographing with a digital camera that the file sizes were very, very small. And because of that, they looked thin whereas digital files from film were thick and rich. So I started to duplicate my file layers and just embed them into each other to make my file be more substantial, to make my image file be more substantial. I'm a bit of a poet too, and I write a lot and a lot of my writing has come out of what I do with my photography, what I do with my art. And it has helped me to be able to understand 
and articulate what it is that so much is intuitive. And I'm not going to do it in French because my accent is absolutely deplorable. I search for color and light, I think, in French without knowing the words. My camera speaks for me, and my heart is full. On my second stay in Giverny, I was most taken by Monet's woodblock collection. Now, this is weird, and there are a lot of things about me I'm going to tell you that are weird. Years earlier, I had been to Maui with a friend who had property there. We spent several weeks. And so he knew all the places to take me. And the place that I loved the most was in the Kiani Peninsula, where the water just surged up against the lava rock. And I felt embodied by Jackson Pollock. I mean, I was so caught up in the kinetic spray and surge of the surf that I was using my remote and changing my shutter speed to get sharp drips and then gossamer of flows. I was just in rapture. And when I was creating this PowerPoint to share with you, I rediscovered that Jackson Pollock was among the artists who lauded Claude Monet as being the precursor of abstract art. What a coincidence to after all these years to finally be connected with you and discover our relationship with Jackson Pollock. So when I returned from this visit in 2006 or 2007, whenever it was, I shared all of these images with a collector of my work. And he was very nonplussed. He said, Holly, these are like tourist snapshots. And I appreciate my support system because I could really spiral into the stratosphere. And he subdued me a bit and I took all of my images and I tucked them away in my hard drive until I had the opportunity to experiment with Nick software. All I wanted to work with was their silver effects. And I created this image from this one. Well, let me tell you, when I did this, I didn't know, I didn't know how it happened, but it absolutely knocked me on my butt. And it took me a while to catch my breath and digest the exploration and the experimentation that I had begun. And after a few days, I went into another of, oh, I had over a over hundred files that I had taken from the Kiani Peninsula. And I created this. And then I went on to create this. And I'm absolutely, I'm beyond ecstatic that I've been using the Techpressionism hashtag in Instagram, and it got picked up, and I, it's going to be part of the fall virtual exhibit. And, you know, the crazy thing is, one of my sons said to me, Mom, don't worry about Instagram. You know, that's for people who are younger than you are. You know, just deal with Facebook and whatever it is you're doing. And I thought, you know, it's, I don't like to be put into a box and have to just follow the dictates of society. In fact, one time I had said to my class when they were coming in with all of these binders and clothing with Jackson Pollock style drip designs on their binders and their folders. I said, I bet you think you're, you've got new stuff in your, in your, in your book bags. 
I said, this stuff is 50 years old. If you really want to study revolutionaries, you should just study artists. So all of these were pieces that I created over a period of time. And I knew I had something. I was doing a solo show and I even posted the, photo, the original photographs from which I created my water music series. But I printed up 10 or 12 of my, of my prints and I sent them to Nick Software. And the next thing I know, I get a phone call from Kevin LaRue, who was with Nick. Nick is no, it's no longer Nick. I think it's DXO or something. They sent me, he said, we're going to put you in our creative pool and we are going to send you all of our software and we will teach you, we will do whatever tutorials you need to get you to learn how to use our software. And I said, thank you very much, but I don't do manuals. I don't follow other people's directions. I need to figure these things out for myself. So I put together for the first time I sent them a whole series of work that I created using assorted Nick software. After traveling the world for decades, I am exploring new territory in cyberspace. Nick filters are my trusty compass and I am recreating the visible. An age, a new age of discovery has just begun. In 2008 or seven, I was interviewed by Karen Lipson of the New York Times. This piece was selected for as best color in, an in a juried exhibition. And she says to me, oh, this has to be digital. And I said, uh-uh, I did this with film. I set my ISO lower because I wanted the color to be saturated. And I knew because I was shooting at high noon that I was going to get a very pointillistic effect from the harsh contrast. Now, during the same time that I had photographed this, I also photographed this image because I've always liked the way reflections smudge and smush color. But once I had all of the Nick software, I was able to create this image from it. And it, this I created eight or 10 years after I took the original photograph. Okay, here we are back in Monet's garden and I was not happy with the wisteria. So I changed it because I wanted it to evoke this emotional power that I felt I was so complete. I was just in love with being in Giverny and inhaling their air and knowing that I was walking and being in the presence of where the Impressionists were years before me. The arbors and the trellises bugged me to pieces. I couldn't stand the intrusion of those green shapes in this lush garden. So I experimented and explored with Photoshop and with Nick software to create this. And when I finished it, I really think it has an Asian tapestry embroidery influence. Here too, I created this from someone who was painting in the garden. Now in 2008, I was coming back from Photo Fest in Houston. The topic of that Photo Fest was China and a consultant thought that I should bring my China work down for the people there to see. And on the way back from Newark Airport, I photographed this through the windshield as my consultant was driving. And there was just something about it that I wanted to turn into something else. And it took many years for me to create this. It's called Night Lights. 
And it was like nothing I had ever done before. So I tucked it away because I didn't know who to share it with until someone suggested to me that I meet this Northport painter, Ward Hooper. She was a freelance writer and she wrote about Ward and his paintings and she wrote about my work a number of times and she thought that we shared something in common. So I met him and he started taking me to places that had inspired him many years before. I'm going to show you some original photographs that I took. And then I will show you what I created from them. And I can't tell you exactly how, except I start with an original photograph. And in Photoshop, I will remove anything that I don't want. And if I need to import something from another image, I will do so. And then I start to create layers and using Nick software and Topaz software, because I did the same thing with Topaz. Somebody had introduced me to Topaz software and I downloaded a trial version. Well, the thing is when you download a trial version, you can't save anything but I outsmarted the technology. I took screenshots of what I was creating, saved them as TIFF files, and then I went into Photoshop and I continued to create. So I created this from this image. Then Ward took me to this location and I created this. We were working together for several months and he kept saying, where are we going to go? What are we going to do with this? And I said, I don't know, Ward, but I'm really enjoying the process. So let's keep doing what we're doing. But he had taught <clears throat> at the Art League of Long Island <clears throat> and suggested that I do a PowerPoint proposal and that we see if we could get an exhibition at the Art League. So as we're putting, and we did, yes, we did. We got that, we got the debut exhibit in 2015. We met in 2014, we had this exhibit in 2015. So as we're putting together the exhibit, he's saying to me, do you have any sailboats? Well. Years earlier, I had been traveling in Nova Scotia and I, was I stopped to photograph this because I was so taken by the color, by the repetition, by the pattern. And it just was being stored on my hard drive and I extracted it. And it was, it, this was hard work. It took me weeks and weeks. And every evening he would call me and say, are you making any progress? Are you making any progress? And finally, I created this that is called Prepping for the Race. Uh, early in the 2000s, I was doing uh, photography for the environment. Uh, I've always had this feeling that mother nature has no voice and I want my work to speak for her. And when I was, when I photographed this on the North Fork of Long Island, I saw the fuel tanks as a dystopian army coming to invade our beautiful land. And when I saw all of the birds flying overhead, it made me think, of Vincent van Gogh and his crows over the farm field. I played around with this image file for many, many years. And ultimately I created this. And what I wound up doing was importing van Gogh's crows over the wheat field into my image because I wanted to evoke this panic, this impending doom and desperation 
to preserve and protect our environment. And this piece has just been selected for an exhibition. Uh, here too, stacked against us, I wanted the smokestacks, which are these strong verticals, to whoops, to oppose the solitary fishermen. Ward took me to Cold Spring Harbor Pond. And at this time, I was sharing all of this work with another colleague who said, oh my God, Holly, what you and Ward are doing, you've got to see if it fits into the art history on Long Island in some way. And as soon as he said that to me, I thought, you know, it's like, oh my God, this is a V8 moment. I should have had a V8. Why not? Arthur Dub and Helen Tour. They were two artists who sailed into Cold Spring Harbor in 1924. And some historians believe and ascribe Arthur Dub as being the first American abstract expressionist artist. So as a result of connecting to Arthur Dove and Helen Tour, Ward says to me one day, I don't know anything about Arthur Dove and Helen Tour, but I could take you to their cottage. So he did, and in a matter of minutes, he directed me to the cottage. And as a result of that, we are now connected to the Heckscher Museum of Art and the Dub Block Gallery in Geneva, New York, where Arthur Dub came from. So there are all of these like intangible, invisible threads that connect us. And sometimes it just takes a long time to discover how connected we are. I would spend Januaries in Sanibel. And of course, I would work on photographing the reflection, the sunsets in the evening. And in 2010, I created this digital photo collage that I called Yellow Sun. Now, once I realized that Ward and I were connected to Arthur Dub and Helen Tour, I started to look for, search for their other artwork that they did that I wasn't familiar with. And when I came upon Arthur Dove's Red Sun, I thought, oh my God, we didn't even know, but here we are together. And here's the open house invite for the Dub Block Gallery. And during all of this collaboration with Ward, I solidified my digital, my technological photography, photo liminalism. And our book came out in 2020, in October 8th, 2020. And we became finalists in the art category. And this past year, this was in the Great American Painting. I've done a whole series of Between Reality and Illusion. And I don't know what made me decide to go back to an early Giverny image file that I had that I never did anything with, but I created this. And in Cuba, I don't normally photograph people, but she was smiling at me as I was walking somewhere very quickly. And I wanted to get her between the bars. And when I got home, I knew that I wanted to bring out all of her wrinkles so that she would be similar to the wrinkles and the wear and tear of her, of her abode. And this is not me because I was a baby at the beginning of this presentation. I didn't age this much, even though it was quite a journey. And I thank you very much. <sighs> Well, thank you very much, Holly, for your presentation. So I'll give her a round of applause. So quietly, of course, because, you know, most of us are muted. <laughs> All right. 
Well, thank you very much, Holly. Um, seeing the progression and of your work and you know, just how you came to the movement, essentially. It's a great journey, great story. Um, does anyone have any questions for Holly that they want to ask or comments or you know, praise? Because I repeat that a lot. We give phrase, praise freely around here. Great work, fantastic, very interesting. Beautiful creations. Nice, nice. Well, you know, I, I have I have a comment. <laughs> All um, right. It's but it it relates it relates to you. You know, oh. in in my water music series, I shed Mother Nature's clothing to reveal to reveal her bones, her muscles, her tendons. It was her raw energy. And very often, I mean, I'm entranced by color, but color has a way of taking us away from the nitty gritty. And when I was going through your generational and was looking at all of the raw power that came from your, from your images, I'm just kind of thinking ahead. And excuse me if you think I'm overstepping, but I really think that your images and my water music have a certain kind of parallelity. And maybe at some point, we might even collaborate together creating black and white and also creating color. I mean, I can see that happening. I'm always open to collaboration. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. I think that would be a very interesting experience for me because I actually don't have that much collaboration experience under my belt to begin with. So this will be another endeavor in that. Well, uh, years ago, uh, Linda Moran, who was the director of Islip Arts and managing the Islip Art Museum, she knew what Ward and I were doing with our collaboration. And she had invited me to become the curator for the museum's open call in 2019 that was called The Art of Collaboration. <laughs> and it was, it was exciting and it was spooky because when you open something up so wide, you don't know what kind of results you're going to get. And the response is from the artists who participated and those who were selected and the media, the, their mediums of expression. It, I mean, musicians were working with painters and there were all kinds of intermixing but they were so excited by the idea of not creating solitarily, but by putting creative, creative heads together to see what might come out. And it just is a very, it's dynamic. I'd, I'd imagine so, because uh, just the things that have come out of the text expressionism collaboration efforts, those have been amazing. Just the, just the how unique um, some of those works are it's it's amazing to me and I'm like I don't want to like toot my own horn or anything about with that but I don't know just for someone that, that has the background that I do and helping to organize and bring these pe people together bring these arts together that's been an experience all its own too because I I'm not um, I haven't actually been in, in the art industry or the art world or ho however you want to say like the greater expanse of, you know, the art community. I haven't really been a part of that or enmeshed in it. So to have that experience with these other artists and to, you know, get them to, or help them produce these works, that's, that's amazing to me. So I'm, I'm just, Oh, I'm excited <laughs> and happy to be here. Happy to be able to work with all of you too. 
you know, it's, it's just wonderful to be part of a process and to go with the wave of it, not to be destination oriented, because when you are focusing on the end result, you miss so many nuances. Yeah, and nuances are very important. <laughs> um, that's, that's one of the things that I don't know, I, I, I talk about this with my wife quite a few times, but I think the just the world at large sometimes just lacks nuance sometimes like they they want to see things in stark black and stark white and just putting things in boxes like this is this this is that there's no intermixing there's there's no bridge in the middle between these things it's like it's we want or people want so badly for there to be absolutes but you can't ignore the fact that the world isn't necessarily in absolutes there's a lot of gray area and varying shades of gray areas because dark grays lighter grays and some grays are almost white some grays that are almost black and you can't really ignore those you you kind of have to try to understand them for what they are and well pe people people like to know that something is is solid that is something as mm -hmm. you said is something is absolute I've always embraced change and discovery. I find it exciting. It doesn't scare me because it's just opening up ide new ideas, new possibilities. And that's, I, that's, I think, what it's all about, being an artist yeah. and being innovative. There are so many people who, are, who, who replicate, you know, they do the same thing over and over again, or it's been done before, and it, it's like, <laughs> not, not that we're all going to be innovators, because Leonard, George Leonard wrote for Esquire magazine ages ago, uh, a book called Mastery. And he said, learn, artists need to learn to love the plateau because we are gonna be on it much more frequently than we're gonna make these steps to rise up. And nobody gets up in the morning and says, aha, today I'm gonna discover something. You know, it just happens. And the more we allow it to occur, the greater the possibility is that it is going to happen. All right, I can, I can definitely get on board with that. All right. Well, before before we move on, um, just want to give Holly another round of applause one more time. And thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. Um, there thank, is quite a few. You. There's quite a bit of praise in the chat <laughs> so far. Um, and I'm pretty sure people in their minds are also praising you and just haven't vocalized it. But it's just, you know what, it's just wonderful to be able to share it with a group of people who can understand and embrace it. It's, I'm not always this vocal because they're not gonna, they're not gonna get it. Right. So it's good to know that you do. Well, thank well, you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Holly, for um, presenting today. I actually had a visit from our mutual friend, Bob Mielenhaus, and, and his wife. They were up in Vermont. He had an exhibition up here. So uh, they were our first house guests in our new place. And uh, he actually sold three paintings. So Wonderful. Wow. My high school art teacher. <laughs> so, nice. Very dear to my heart. Art, art teachers, a lot of times, they... I can remember the art teacher that I had in uh, elementary school and she made an impact on me all those years ago. So I think art, art teachers are very special, very important. <laughs> all right. That being said, I think we can go ahead and get on with me, I guess. <laughs> uh, so hold on, let me go ahead and pull up my presentation, which, share. So Dava, since you're presenting, I'm gonna give a little quick 
intro here. <laughs> um, you know, Davo was one of the first people that I actually connected with over the phone when, when I was first getting this rolling and just initially had rolled out, you know, the idea of using a hashtag. And there was like, basically at that point, a micro site that was like a one page site, like, hey, use the hashtag, you know, um, we're putting this group together, you know, and that was like the whole of it. And, um, and then I saw, you know, his work online and he, I think messaged me, like I, I, you know, reached out to him when I saw the work and I thought, wow, this is like, what I think of when I think of text Russianism, you know, and he messaged me something like, you know, I really just feel like I've found like, you know, where I'm supposed to be or something like that, like something that I really connect with. I didn't know that other people were doing this type of work you know, with computers and, and <laughs> Davo's enthusiasm was one of the things that made me, you know, decide like, this is something worth developing growing out because like I really felt like um you know that feeling that that sense of identification and that there is something there was something to this that you know could be really interesting you know and I think that um yeah so and, and definitely like Davo has been a, a very important part of you know the project in that uh it was his decision actually or his suggestion to start recording and publishing these sessions because prior to the the eighth salon, I think we were just mm -hmm. having these meetups and, and I think and that was just like, Hey, like, why don't we record these, you know? And then sort of the idea of putting the YouTube channel together grew out of that Roz jumped in with the interview format and, you know, it's, it's developed organically, but I just want to, you know, um, give Davo a, a good shout out in terms of really helping with this project forward. Well, Thank you very much. And it's actually funny that you mentioned part of that because part of what you just said is actually in this presentation. <laughs> so we'll, we'll get to that point, but thank you very much, Colin, for your, for your kind words. And it does actually make me feel really special. I'm not gonna lie, um, but I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Like that's, that's the thing. It also, I wouldn't be here if I hadn't decided to start putting my work out on Instagram because that was what ended up connecting us. So I know it's, it has been an amazing journey this past year. And I, I really want to, I want to ride this way for as long as possible. Hopefully it never ends. I would, I'd be happy with that if it never ended, but I'm going to ride it for as long as I can and try to keep it going myself. <laughs> Um, does that, can everyone see my, see the first slide? Okay, cool. All right. So let's get started. My name is Devante. Um, a lot of you know me as Davo now, Bradley, pronouns he, him. I'm an artist, writer, poet, philosopher, gamer, streamer, activist, and a bunch of other things that might not be able to fit on this list, but that's kind of like the, the general, like, the big net. <laughs> There's some other stuff, but um, I have a lot of interests, always have, always will, um, always learning. Uh, so about me and my story, this, this presentation is actually going to cover pretty much my a portion of my life up into, you know, joining the movement and then what I've been doing the past year within the movement, things I've been working on and up into my book pretty much that I've published, or at least the first part of my collection of poems. But um, I grew up impoverished. Um, I grew up in a single family, I mean, a single parent household of three. Um, it was me, my uh, older brother and my older sister. And um, I, at the time, because you know, I was a kid, didn't know my mom had mental health issues. Uh, how could I know? I like, I was a kid. Kids don't usually know these things, but you know, you can kind of pick, I was like, something isn't quite right, but you can't put your finger on it. But um, during that time, if you've read some of uh, my poems, because these poems actually cover, generational covers the first eight or nine years of my life. So you would actually probably know a good chunk about my childhood from reading those poems. Um, computers and video games, those were my escapes. Those were the things I do. Those were, that was how I connected with my siblings actually um, during that time. Um, and also 
like just computers in general were one of my initial gateways into art because I started painting or started digital creations with MS Paint on Windows 98 several years ago. I was playing around with Windows um, MS Paint and creating a lot of geometric figures and shapes and playing around with colors with a lot of black backgrounds, which you will actually see pop up because that's how I got back into art, which I'll go over a little bit later. But it was a lot of triangles and squares and like diamond shapes. And all of them were on stark black backgrounds. That was the thing that I love to do. And I still kind of do that sometimes, but um, I had gotten away from that for a while. But that, anyway, college, I went to, I attended Hamden Sydney College here in Virginia. Very small, private, liberal arts, all male college. Um, former Presbyterian college, um, very conservative. I am not very conservative. <laughs> um, there, there was definitely a, that experience, that four years there definitely colored my, like my perspective of the world. Um, for good and for bad, like it's just, I learned a lot there. Um, that's how I got into philosophy and thinking and, you know, being more introspective and all that good stuff. And then fast forward between that time, because that was 2014 when I graduated, to 2020, where I became a full-time artist during the pandemic. Like I started creating art consistently and more regularly during the pandemic. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to turn this into a career because that was something that I always cared about. Um, initially, I want to become like a character artist or concept artist, something dealing with video games. That's where my mind was at the time with other kinds of art kind of being secondary to that. It's like I was exploring that, playing around with it, but it wasn't my initial focus. And kind of just charting that journey, you can actually see in these next couple of slides where I was um, with where I started. <laughs> so these are sketches of mine from when I was in high school, 2005 and 2009. So pretty much freshman year to senior year in high school. Character art. These were um, role playing characters that I came up with um, that were based off of a video game that I loved called Dot Hack. And um, yeah, anatomy work could, could use some work, I'd say, <laughs> looking back. Uh, but, you know, that was video games and stuff was very much an inspiration for my work. So I did a lot of character art, fan art, a uh, lot of Pokemon. There's actually one right behind me. I got a sketch of Charizard right behind me because still happens. Um, more Pokemon, as, as I said. Um, but this was early college. Um, this is a little bit significant because this is also around the time in 2001, um, I mean 2011, sorry, not 2001. In 2011 is when I actually bought my first Wacom tablet, my first drawing tablet, because I had always, always, always wanted to create like actually be able to sketch digital art, not just working with, uh, you know, my keyboard and mouse. So I was like, my first paycheck after working at the library, I'm getting myself a tablet. And that's what I did. And I started exp experimenting with, um, started experimenting with, you know, how to use color because I was afraid of color because I hadn't actually used it because permanent marker and uh, color pencil and all that stuff, those were permanent and I had limited resources. <laughs> So um, I started playing around with colors and you know, trying to refine that. Um, I did it inconsistently, I guess, but from the time that I was in college, I was doing that very passively as I worked on my coursework. Um, and then towards the end, I started to try and explore more painterly stuff. Like I wanted to not just do drawings, but try to do digital paintings. Um, and it was hard um, <laughs> to say to say it bluntly. Like it was hard because I had never done anything like that. This is somebody that hadn't actually taken a two D, three D, or any other kind of art course up until this point. So this was all stuff that I had learned through tutorials on Deviant Art or just various places on the internet. And the piece on the left that is dated for August 9th of twenty thirteen 
This is actually a piece that I did for my then girlfriend, now wife. Um, and it was very special because I took, I think it took me probably about 22 hours in total working on this piece. And I was zooming in, zooming out, and you know, I was trying to figure out how to shade things properly and do highlights and trying to figure out like if it was just a good composition because I wasn't sure because I didn't know what the heck a composition was really. It's just like I knew that things looked pretty and sometimes you can arrange things to look pretty. So that's 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 what I was kind of functioning off of during that time. And it came out really well. I was so proud of myself. I was, and Allison was very happy with the product. She actually had it on her phone screen, like as her lock screen for like years. <laughs> like she still has it as her lock screen to this day. And this is in 2013 when I made this for her. So I was like, man, I guess my art can really resonate with people sometimes. Um, but it wasn't, I didn't have that kind of moment where I was like, I should do more of this. It was that because I took so much time on it and because this was so personal, I didn't really want to like continue forward making art like that. Um, but I occasionally did make art for myself, like the one on the right. And just it, again, exploring colors and trying to paint things. And then fast forward six years, because that's, there was a hiatus with my art for a very long time. Um, I struggled with like accepting that, you know, I may have been improving. I was struggling with like where my skill level was at. I didn't feel that it was at a good point. And I was getting frustrated because with like the character art and the concept art stuff, I was not nearly at the level I wanted to be at. And um, it was frustrating because there was so much I had to learn. There was so much that, you know, I was beating myself up over the art that I was making every now and again. Like I would make something and be like, you could do better than that. Except that was after spending like eight or nine hours on a piece and then not being happy with the result. And it was just, it was hard. And I was like, man, Maybe I shouldn't do this anymore. And just like, just do it every now and again is like a hobby because it wasn't, it wasn't working out. And there was this moment during the pandemic, um, I was unemployed at that point because I lost my job. Um, I was working in retail at the time. I lost my job due to the pandemic. And I was at home and I was trying to figure out what the heck it was that I want to do with myself. What did I want to do with the rest of my life? Because I couldn't, I didn't want to go back to retail. That's not something I wanted to do. And, you know, video games didn't seem like an option to, for me, but I knew I wanted to do something with art, but what I had no idea. It's like, I, it's not like I could be a painter because I couldn't afford materials, but I had my tablet and everything from all those years of off and on working on digital art. And there was a moment where I was streaming, I was streaming video games because I did that off and on over the years. And at the end of the, or towards the end of the stream, I was like, well, maybe I should stream my art or stream progression working on art. And it was like the last five minutes, like I, I have this video still up on my, on my gaming uh, Facebook page. The last five minutes, I was just playing around in the software that I use. I use a uh, software called Krita now, but at the time I was using something called Paint Tool Sci. I was just playing around with Paint Tool Sci, not really having an intention in mind. I was just making brush strokes. And this happened. Like literally th this happened. Like this, this was not planned. This was not structured. This I ended up just coming to be. And I was happy with that. I was like, this actually looks amazing. And it took five minutes. Like I'm happier with this thing that took five minutes that I had been with any of the other work that had taken hours and hours to work on. And it was done. Like I could walk away from this, it was done. And I was like, that was that first moment. I was like, maybe, maybe this is what I should be trying to do. And so that was July. And so then I started experimenting. Um, I created my first series. Um, I use that very loosely because it was 
I didn't actually know what a series was at the time. Like when I say that I had not, well, I had virtually no familiarity with how the art community worked or how like the greater art world at large work, even art history, I was a complete novice, complete amateur, very, very low level um, experience, very low level knowledge. But I was told, I was like, well, maybe you should start working or start thinking about working in a series. And I was like, okay, I guess having some sort of cohesive theme going on could help. So I kind of tapped into my roots in my from my youth where, you know, I was making artwork on black backgrounds and just using like basic colors, very basic shapes, um, except this time I was using like brush strokes, like because I was just trying to get a handle on some of the brush strokes from the software I was using, which was uh, Paint Tool Sai at the time, um, which is what I had been using for my other artwork. And this series is It doesn't have the impact that I think it should now, but I, I actually came back to the series a couple of times um, over the months. Um, but the series was pretty much about, and also this is like not the entire one, there's like maybe four or five other works that are part of it. Um, but they were all about my family and, you know, just different parts or different aspects of my family that I felt had a major impact on why my family is the way that it is now. So my mother's anguish, she has, she was diagnosed with severe depression. She had probably had that for most of her life um, from childhood on and never been treated for it, never got seen for it. She didn't even acknowledge that she had it until she was almost 50. Um, my father's anger. One of the only like heartfelt conversations I've had with this man and I got him to finally open up to me. He told me that um, pretty much that for the longest time, he did not understand why he was so mad. He didn't know where his anger was coming from. He just knew that he had it and it frustrated him to no end. And it he was darn near 60 when he finally got therapy for it. But between my mom's depression and his anger issues that had, you know, repressed anger issues, recipe for disaster for poor marriage, I'd bet. And not also the greatest environment for Peter raising children. So my brother, after my dad left, ended up becoming like the head of the household. Um, the man of the house. He had a learning disability and ADHD. Not kind of the position somebody like that should be in. And my sister, um, she, her mental health took a drastic turn once she ran off to college. Um, if in the poems that you'll, you'll read later, because these are actually 50 poems of 200, there are 150 more poems I haven't actually done the illustrations for, them. but she changed very drastically later on, right around the time of college, and she just took a decline. I'm not sure if it's schizophrenia or something else, but she is not well. Um, and it had a, like that threw a wedge in our relationship uh, as siblings, my brother, all that good stuff. But anyway, that was that was the kind of premise behind that series. I revisit that every now and again. Um, and then I started experimenting more with uh, just all the tools that I had in the software I was using. So I started creating, you know, just all sorts of things. It, it's hard to like say what the method to my madness was, but the kind of overarching feeling was that I just want to create. I don't care what it looks like. I don't, I don't really care about like the, the brushes that I use, but I want to make something that looks good to me and I can say that it's finished and it's done and that's it. So it was very like therapeutic because I was also going through or help processing some of the emotion that I was dealing with because pandemic also, um, issues with my family. So got depression, um, anxious and entwined. Entwined was kind of in reference to, you know, being entwined still with my family, even though I haven't actually seen some of them in more than a decade. Um, they're still having an impact on me. And then um, there was some other experimental stuff that I did um, where you know, I was experimenting with painterly effects and that sort of stuff and um, experimenting with color, still using a lot of black backgrounds because that was where I was comfortable. 
uh, it was still fun for me. Um, I think I got an inspiration for the one the left from actually going on Instagram and just looking up abstract art because I was like, I think that's the kind of art that I'm doing. Like that makes sense. So I was like, I wonder what other abstract art styles are there. And so that's where Gold Flush came from. And Yoru um, soon thereafter also developed in kind of the same thing where, you know, um, color fields and geometric shapes and all that good stuff. Um, and then period of time where, again, just playing. Um, I would say there was a point where I realized that what I really want to do was just have fun with the creation process. And I had probably never had so much fun creating art before up until this point where I was legitimately just playing with my, uh, with my brushes in, in the software that I was using and just having a go at just creating. Uh, it was, I remember I told Allison a couple of times, I was like, I'm having so much fun. And she was like, yeah, keep doing that. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna keep doing that. <laughs> so play and the idea of play goes hand in hand with my work, even to this, even now. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it because video games involves a lot of playing too. So that whole idea of play and playing and enjoyment very, very much intertwined with who I am and what I do. And then, you know, just further exploration of other emotions. Um, the, the titling sometimes is a little interesting because sometimes I just didn't care about the title. And I came up with something that, you know, was the first thing that came to my mind after seeing that it was done. Um, the one on the left kind of reminded me of like metal arbor a little bit or like metal plating something that was constrained or you know just safer and the one on the right kind of reminded me of like the edges of a sword or two swords together and thus the title swords i guess <laughs> um and then this one this one was a kind of pitiful little moment utter chaos this was actually the first non-commissioned work I'd ever sold as an artist. Um, I posted this on Facebook just because I was, during that time, I was just rapidly sharing my work as I was working on it because I was having so much fun and I was sharing it with people. And, you know, a, a friend of mine, he was like, I need this as a print. And I was like, um, I don't know how to go about doing that, but we'll figure something out. And I end up figuring out, you know, different websites I could go to to um, uh, sell or create my work as a physical representation because I wasn't even thinking about that at the time, and get this to this person that they can, so they can put it on their wall, and they love the piece still. It's like it's on their wall. It's next to some of the other pieces of artwork that I love, and I was like, all right, I think I'm, I think I'm onto something, and. Uh, <laughs> Then this other work uh, tied down again, goes back to um, feelings about my family because that was still very much heavy on me. But all of this was in like the span of like what, two months, so July and August, all of these different styles and all of these different things were happening all in just a two month time span. And then this happened. Um, this was actually originally called Very Play because that was during the time that I was fast and loose with the titles I was creating. And it later came to be known as Aspire. This is a pivotal piece of mine because this was kind of the moment where I was like, this is where, this is what I need to be making. This is where I need to be. Like this is a style or something, something close to this style is something where I want to do. And I remember posting this and there was so much positive feedback on it. And I was just like, all right, this is again solidifying that maybe this is the path I should be going on. Uh, I actually, I still owe Colin your, your uh, part of the trade. So it's, it's coming. I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> but Colin is actually going to be the owner of a signed copy of uh, signed print, metal print of this. And probably going to be the only metal print of this that's going to be created. Um, but it's this piece is very important to me. Um, and it came about during 
um, what I call the ink line play period. Uh, because even though there's no ink, the, the tool that I was using, is I've transitioned to software called Krita. And the tool that I used to create this was called the Chrome Ink Pen. Now, normally when you think of an ink pen, it's like, yeah, you, you have a little, little point, but you're not supposed to go beyond that. Otherwise, who knows what's going to happen? I was like, I wonder if I go beyond that, what's going to, what's going to, what, what it's going to look like. And it created this really interesting effect with all these lines and shapes and like this three dimensionality that was just, it felt right. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've considered myself to be a very thoughtful person, but I can't really put into words just the feeling that creating this evoked. Like it just felt like it was supposed to be. And so that kickstarted an exploration and utilizing or learning um, what else that tool that brush could do. And I created probably 60, 70 or so drawings and paintings using that. Um, again, fast and loose with the titles because I was in a rapid production mode. Like I was pumping these out for hours, um, for days at a time. So you have such play, Chris cycle, radiate matey, uh, and butterfly. <laughs> and, um, and then the movement happened in September. This is actually the piece that Colin found um, that made him want to reach out to me. And I, and this is all he said. All he did was say hashtag text precedism and with the little fire emoji. And I was just like, what does that mean? That was my first response. I was like, what is, what, what is that? And I, I looked into it, I looked into the movement and I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense now. I see that. And I sent him this response on the left here. So the, that's where I was getting back to you. I actually included <laughs> that little exchange, that correspondence. And, you know, it was just me thanking him, um, it, like informing me that his movement existed and, you know, feeling that I was seen and that I was found and this New York artist <laughs> found me and, you know, was seeing that said my work looked good. And that meant a lot to me as someone that, you know, I, I was not a professional artist at that point. I hadn't gone to art school. Like none of this stuff that, you know, traditional, traditional um, background for artists have happened with me. And to be recognized in such a way, I was like, wow, I feel really, really validated here. And it was an amazing feeling. And I was like, and it was just another notch on the road of like, this is where I need to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Nothing else had been clicking like this up till now, but everything is coming together, I feel as it should and when it should. So I was like, this, this is where I need to be. This is what I need to be doing. So, and that was part of the Expire series, that, that work um, that was called Falling or Falling Hope. Um, that was me exploring more use of color and lines and you know, just all sorts of structures. Um, but this is like the first kind of the first series after the family series I created. And then of course, because going to fall because it was at the end of September, um, I was like, no, I'll make a, make a fall series. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it, but I'll just call it the fall series. Um, this is a few of the works from that series. There's of course, there were other works in the Aspire series as well, and there's other works in the fall series too, but I'm just trying to give a like snapshot of like what, what more or less the, uh, the rest of the series kind of looks like. And one of these you might actually recognize from the Facebook group, <laughs> the one on the top left, Is It Worth It? That's actually the banner for the movement on Facebook. Um, I think it's the Tech Expressionists page is where it is. Um, but yeah, so that was during a time where, you know, I was playing around. I 
had discovered like color fields and I was like oh I'll experiment with that a little bit and so I came up with uh it's chaotic which I have uh, my first metal print ever created was of that piece which looks a little blurry because my my webcam is um blurring out my background but apparently that also includes art <laughs> but that got me on the path of trying to put my work on um, HD aluminum, which another member of the movement gave me the idea for because she was like, yeah, HD aluminum prints are amazing. Here's this website. I was like, oh yeah, I'll explore that. Uh, but yeah. So then next series was the Blue Sin series. Um, this is just two from, from that series, but um, I think there's like seven or eight other works in this series, but I was trying to like dial in on the feeling of calmness, uh, serenity, peacefulness, because that's what I was trying to find in myself. Um, so I also started at that time exploring um, the use of watercolor or watercolor like brushes in my work. That's what produced the kind of wispy effects around some of these figures here. Um, so that coupled with the chrome ink pen and all that is what produced that effect. And then we have another interesting break. <laughs> um, this is the, the period of time where, you know, I was doing community stuff and collaboration because there was a point in my life, um, cause you know, there was a lot going on. After working on the Blue Zen series, I had realized that there was a part of my life that was missing. Now I joined, I joined, I joined the tech expressionism movement. That was a community. Still fairly new, but I, that was part of the community. But I was also thinking about like my actual like physical community because I'd never really had like a neighborhood or like even just thinking of myself as part of a neighborhood or a greater community outside of just my house. That was something that I never really felt before. And I was like, I think I probably should have something like that. And the work on the left called Community was actually created during a virtual paint night um, that was put on by um, a nonprofit organization called Art 180. And I was doing this as people were, you know, painting in real time with like traditional stuff. And there was me over here creating this digitally. Like I actually had my, it was in a Zoom meeting. And um, I was making this in real time during that meeting. And there was just a unique kind of energy that was in that room, even though it was virtual, even though that I knew it was like virtually no different than, you know, the meetings that I have here with you guys. It felt a little different. Maybe it was the music, I don't know. <laughs> but it felt different. And I've honestly not actually been able to create another work quite like this one since, even though I've tried, like I've actually actively tried to make works that looked similar or felt similar to community, I just haven't been able to do it. Um, it it's just that unique. And I end up entering it into a, um, an auction for mental health awareness. So uh, Mental Health of America was actually in an auction um, for that organization as a fundraiser. And then the piece on the right was my first, one of the first collaboration pieces that I did. Um, this was done with um, Diana Davia. And that was from the Text Expressionism Collab One. And there's another piece um, there's because we did pass back and forth a couple of times, but there's other pieces. But this was the first time that I had worked with another artist directly. So that's why that's included next to community because it was the first time that you know things are starting to come together. Um, and then I started experimenting with words um, and writing because I'm a writer and sometimes a poet, more recently more of a poet, but uh, words and uh, I have actually a fascination with words and phrases. Um, it comes with having a good memory when it comes to that kind of thing, but not necessarily a good way because not all the words are good. Like there's a lot of negative words that are floating around in my head that I can't forget that were said. Um, so 
kind of think of this in a way as like just thought graffiti. Like there was art that was created and then there was words and stuff that was overlaid on top of that that were just kind of the first things that came to mind as I was thinking about this work. Um, and this was titled, What Hurts? This is one of the first pieces of 2021, by the way. Um, and then this is another piece um, titled, Is It Faulty? Which going back to you know my previous roots doing poetry, um, there was a poem that I wrote, I need to find it, um, but it's actually, there's pieces of that poem interlaced in, in this work. Um, the central figure is kind of shaped like a heart because of what the poem was initially based off of was heartbreak. Um, the poem was titled uh, Faulty Blood Pump. <laughs> and so that's kind of where this came to be. And I actually end up creating my own font that I use from time to time now. Um, so I can actually type in my own font <laughs> when I need to. And more of that, um, actually, I think I, I did a live kind of explanation of these works anyway, on stream on Instagram live one day. But these are predominantly words. There's very little actual like drawing in these. Um, the one on the left, there's a little bit of drawing with the chrome ink pen and then a lot of words and phrases all throughout. It would take me about 30 minutes to explain everything that's in these <laughs> individually, but there is um, something on Instagram Live. It might actually be on Instagram TV where you can go through and I actually walk through all the phrases of at least one of these. But some of the, some of the things are talking about just my ideas about or thoughts about art and my feeling as an artist. Uh, I think the one on the right, yeah, some, some like the negative self-talk. It's like up here in the top left corner, it's like you're, you're not good or you're not a good fit. Um, are you even black? So also questions about, you know, my racial um, status because I actually did have an identity crisis at one point growing up. Um, <laughs> but some of these, which, also, if you read the collection of poems, you also get a feel for some of that stuff in there too, but a little bit more of that's explored later. Uh, but a lot of it, it's just a lot of thoughts and a lot of feelings just jumbled together. And then there was some work that I did for during Black History Month. Um, these are based, these colors are significant in that they're all based off of the Pan-African flag, which is red, black and green. And what all of these colors correspond to are pretty much what that is actually saying. So the red of the Pan-African flag corresponds to the blood of the ancestors that you know died either on their way to um, America or wherever they were being headed to um, during the transatlantic slave trade. Um, the black references or is reference to the fact that the diaspora, even though it's so wide and vast that it's still all connected and that's why it's in the middle of the Pan-African flag. If you actually see it, there's, it's a bar where red is on top, green is at the bottom, and there's this black bar in the middle because that's the connector between the two. And the green on the bottom represents you know, the natural resources and you know, just bounty of Africa itself, the, um, the ancestral con uh, continent. So that's why it's entitled Bountiful Land. And these are other uh, two other pieces kind of in that same motif, that same color scheme, red, black, and green. Um, one left literally being called Pan-African and the one on the right is disconnected. Now that one is significant uh, because back to the whole me having an identity crisis as a black person and because my status and just uh, for a lot of factors, um, I'd never actually really felt connected at all really to either the black community or like my ancestral origins. This was all like, I felt so distant and away from all of that. And it's still a feeling that I fight with today. So like you have this shape or this form in the bottom left corner, that's kind of a representation of like black culture and Africa and, you know, the black community and the top right, it's more or less like the embodiment of me, my mind, my soul, 
and they're trying to connect, but they're just also being like potentially pulled apart. Um, but yeah, that's what that work is about. I actually wrote a blog about that um, not so long ago, and I can share that later if anybody wants to, but I'm not much of a blogger. <laughs> And then I, after that, there was a period of time where I just did a kind of rapid, very rapid exploratory period again, because that's what I love to do, with experimentation and just trying to make new things. And it's probably about 20 or so entitled works that I did. Some are black and white, some feature color, but all of them are more or less trying to do something different that I hadn't quite done before. Apparently, I also forgot to include the titles for these, but the one on the left is out of my mind. I remember that specifically. A lot of color work. And these, one on the left I actually animated. Um, wanted to actually include that animation, but I could not get it to work. But there's a little GIF that's associated with the one on the left that I was thinking about turning into an NFT. Um, and there's some other stuff that you, I, I'll highlight a bit later, but there are actually like some motifs or symbols that I actually include kind of infrequently with, uh, with my work. Um, and then we went to, um, this is later in tw uh, 2021, and we went to Myrtle Beach. And I took some uh, photographs there of the water and the beach and I made some like composite digital painting slash photography stuff. My first time going to Myr Myrtle Beach didn't actually travel a whole lot when I was younger. So this was a fun experiment because I had always wanted to you know do a little bit of photography work in the first place and being able to mix that with what I was currently doing it was a good time it was fun. Um, this was not based off a photograph I took but it was based off a photograph of a wave. I love this one. I loved how it turned out. And it's actually almost like a collage too, because the bottom section here actually comes from some other paintings that I did. And I cut and pasted it into that, overlaid it, painted over it. And it created a very interesting effect, <laughs> I'll, I'll say. Probably won't be able to do it again, maybe. I don't know. I didn't record the process, but I vaguely remember how I did it. Um, and then I got more into the idea of creating digital collages. And that's where these two came into place. The first one was um, actually, there's por portions of this one on the left that actually came from Crash, C2, and Making Waves. Like if you look at this top right corner here and down here, down here, top left corner, those are all from those previous works. Um, and the one on the right and the groove was made in a similar way, but there was also, you know, paintings with that. So it's an amalgam of all sorts of things. And also around that time, I had discovered the Afrofuturist movement. And I was like, a lot of that is figurative. And I don't necessarily do figurative work at this time, but I did notice that there was a theme of certain colors being regularly used in the Afrofuturist movement. So I was like, I'll just take those and play with it and see what happens. So that um, was In the Groove and Of the Earth, which um, actually came before In the Groove. I actually have them out of order, but yeah, this was like my initial Afrofuturist piece based off of that. So there's a lot of gold, earthy tones, red, um, a lot of earth in the blues. The blues are representative of like technology, like being in the future, like that's the kind of like light beams and stuff. That's more or less where that, um, that color comes from, which it popped up a lot. Like that specific color actually popped up a lot in a lot of Afrofuturist work that I found. So I was like, I guess it's something that I should definitely include. And here we have collages that weren't started as collages. It was just me trying to demonstrate to people um, just how common the um, eye of truth symbol that I came up with was featured in some of my works. So I kind of cataloged it everywhere it appeared. And these are, 
I kind of got the idea for this based off of, you know, during my time when I was studying Basquiat and I was, you know, fascinated by Basquiat. I resonated with his story, his history, and I was devouring like his life story on a regular basis. And one of the things that he did was he came up with a symbol, his, that crown that he liked to use. And this is I, more or less the equivalent of Basquiat's crown. It's my eye of truth. And it always takes some, some form. It might not be all the same angle, might not even all be in the same style, but it's almost always, always, always representative of the same idea of the work itself has an eye that's looking at the viewer as you're looking as the viewer is looking at the work itself so it's kind of like a two-way communication street where the work is examining you as you examine it um and i also took like the idea of like the eye of horus so it also means protection so it's watching you protecting you that kind of idea and um oh i really it also kind of <laughs> it also kind of lines up with the idea of um, who I am as a person because one of the things that kind of defines me is that I'm an observer. I'm not necessarily always an actor, but I observe constantly. Uh, there's actually a poem <laughs> in there entitled, uh, about hypervigilance because um, I'm constantly watching, constantly observing everything that is around me, like just trying to look for anything that might be significant to either my safety or you know maybe something I should just watch out for just looking for patterns that kind of stuff always 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 doing that I, I, I wish I could turn it off but I can't uh, but it's it served me fairly well um, I've, I've recognized a lot of patterns with a lot of things over the years like even when it comes to behavior um, and I could like accurately predict certain things before it even happens because patterns uh, that I've observed. But yeah, this is just um, several of them. And I'm realizing that my, my presentation is probably going for a bit longer <laughs> than I intended. But uh, here, here's some more play stuff. I was experimenting with some neon stuff because um, I like neon color scheme. And was trying to figure out how to incorporate that into my own artwork. And uh, this is also during the time where I was experimenting with NFT work. Um, the one on the right was actually uploaded on Hicket Nunk, which is why it's titled Nunk, which I can't remember what that actually means in Latin. <laughs> um, and then some other, um, just other stuff that I've worked on um, that's a little bit more figurative or actually more like art historical, um, which, I don't normally do a whole lot of work like this, but it's it's nice to do every now and again. And um, this one, Lost Connections, kind of a continuation of kind of the things I was exploring back in uh, Black History Month, so back in February, where you know you have your reds, your blacks, your greens, um, but also features an actual like noticeable shape. Um, that's the cowrie shell, and the cowrie shells are they were for a long time used as currency actually um, for a very long time and but they also had like spiritual meanings associated with them as well um, and in African culture a lot of African cultures they were very significant uh, actually if you look at a lot of African art you will see cowrie shells more often than not in a lot of it and so um, I was thinking about again you know my lost connections to that and was kind of bridging that gap but I also discovered that the colors red and black, which I have an extremely high affinity for, are also representative apparently to connections and spirituality um, in some African culture. So I was like, huh, I guess I was channeling that without realizing it. But that's where that, um, that's how that came about. And then there was a departure. That's me, that's me as a kid. Um, that bright blonde haired child. <laughs> Um, with the blonde afro, that was B. Um, these are pictures taken from the time that my family was more or less still whole. These are also the only photos really of me as a kid that currently exists now because a lot of my childhood, like a lot of 
what my material childhood is, is gone. Um, is either lost due to being in storage and we lost our storage unit or it was just thrown away accidentally, but I literally have no childhood photos really anymore, except for the ones that I saved and scanned as a kid when I was like, because I put these online when I was like 10 years old and they're in an old photo bucket account and I pulled them from that photo bucket account for this and I decided to make this and interesting enough, my father of all people decided to buy a print of this um I guess maybe he felt guilty I don't know but it was it was weird it was a weird thing um my dad purchasing this um yeah and it wasn't even I wasn't even <laughs> necessarily just trying to sell it either it was just something that I was posting but apparently I have I have a way of resonating with people anyway uh AI collaboration stuff uh, this is me painting over playform stuff. I faded, fed it over 300 paintings and drawings of mine and it put out stuff that's like on the right. And on the left is things that I like painted over. So there's that. And now we come to my book. Book of short poems, generational. Um, started and I know, I know we're getting actually low on time because we only have like 15 minutes left. So I apologize because I got wrapped up in speaking, but um, this project is literally an endeavor of processing trauma and introversion, learning from my history, accepting things. It's, it's a lot, there's a lot within this. And this is just the first book of 50, um, not 50 books, I'm sorry, 50 <laughs> poems. There are 200 short poems. The first book is 50. There's going to be three other books after this one. I'm still doing the art and everything for those, but they'll be released uh, periodically, probably like once every three months or so. Um, the next one's going to come out in on uh, Black Friday is when I'm hoping to have that released. Um, but that combines, this project combines being an artist book because I was fascinated with the idea of an artist book with an autobiographical nature and also my love of poetry, which is something that I hadn't actually done in a very, very, very long time. I used to write a lot um, when I was younger, mostly to help me process the what I was going through as a kid because I went through a lot. But I stopped writing for, for whatever reason, I don't know why. But this is me again, kind of revisiting my roots, just like how I got started with abstract specialism, revisiting my roots and reconnecting with my younger self. And that's what this project kind of started with. And I will be honest, I cried several times while writing these and making these. Um, so I, I guess I hadn't quite processed or even like some of the stuff I hadn't even actually talked about with people, period, before writing it. Like some of these stories were even new to my wife who's known me for almost a decade now. And um, every single poem in this book, every poem of the 200, all of them have some relevant story related to my life. Every single one, all 200 of them correspond to a specific time or period in my life. And it's currently available as an ebook uh, through Amazon and it's on paperback, but that project in particular, the, all of this, everything, to expressionism, my, my, the pandemic, all this kind of led up to this project, which is where I'm at now. And yeah, it's, um, it's been a journey. It's been a very <laughs> interesting journey. Um, you all, you got my, essentially my artistic journey from childhood to now, as well as the development of my professional art journey from the start till now, because it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> But yeah, that's it. Um, I've got nothing else. We got 15 minutes left. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Questions? Are, there, are, are there any questions, concerns, comments? Um, I think I saw some questions earlier in the chat. Let me stop sharing my screen so I can properly. Also, yeah, that, that link there will take you directly to the Amazon page if you're watching this after the fact. A bit all right. Okay, we're good. 
I see, I see applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my wife is also applauding because she saw she's so supportive like that. But yeah, that's me. That's my story. That's that's why I'm here. Um, scrolling back up through the <laughs> through the comments because I'm sure I missed some things. Okay. There's a lot of comments. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> uh, Davo, I had a, a live comment. I really sure. enjoyed, really enjoyed your presentation. It was really awesome to see the development of your work. Uh, really enjoyed it, and uh, I and I love your book. I acquired a copy. Oh, thank you. And uh, recommend it. So, <laughs> e excellent. Keep keep doing what you're doing, and let it flourish and develop. Thank you. I'm just, uh, trying to, I know, I knew there was somebody that asked a question. I'm trying to find it. And I think, hold on. Uh, probably help if I wasn't skimming. <laughs> All right, but there's there is a lot of praise at least. Oh, is the complete work you are developing digitally or involvement of hand drawing or art? Um, if it's only digital, what software are you using specifically for pen and ink and blue watercolor effects? So, oh, um, so my process is I I paint and draw digitally using a drawing tablet. This. It's a XP Pen 15 um, is what I use these days. And I use a software called Krita, which is a free, um, mostly open source software, I believe, um, that receives regular updates. It's like Photoshop, but less memory intensive. And it feels a lot better to paint and draw in than Photoshop, in my opinion. Um, and that's from coming from Photoshop to using Paint Tool Sci to using Krita. Um, as far as like the actual book, though, um, I used a couple different things. I used Google Docs, actually, and software called Kindle Create to help me format and create the book, um, at least the ebook anyway. And then Google Docs helped me create the PDF and everything like that. And um, yeah. Oh, Michael, you got something? Yes. So. Um... Really, really powerful work, Davo, um, gotta say. Um, so I guess I have a couple couple comments and and for you also with kind of dovetailing into Holly's work as well and expressionism, but there's there's an artist, maybe you're aware of him or not. I think he's Ethiopian, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Ibrahim El, -Sah El, -Sah El Salahi. And a lot of your work seems to have some elements. Um, and your geometric works that you showed early on with the black backgrounds, mm -hmm. they're very raw. They're very powerful to me. And the, the evolution that you've taken since then where you have where your prominence are much more organic flowing lines um, are powerful but in a very different way and I'm just kind of curious it feels like a really distinctively different expression mode and I don't know if that was technology driven by some of the tools or if there was something personal, because to me, they're both strong vibes, but those early geometric ones feel very raw and very edgy. And I know maybe because they're ge because there's very stark lines in there, but there's something very, very internally different that's coming from you. That might be due to the fact that when I was creating those, I was very much trying to capture the feeling 
that I used to, like as a kid working in MS Paint, working that way and making geometric shapes in MS Paint and that kind of stuff. That's what I was trying to get at during that time and like bring that into now. And like, if this, if, if my childhood self had access to the technology and stuff okay. like that now, that's kind of what I envisioned with the work that I was making would probably look like. I, I think they're really powerful. I was really drawn to them, which it, I hadn't seen that those works before. Mm -hmm. So it, it just like hit me like a brick because what I had seen of yours are your more recent works and they're still very, very powerful, but in a very, for me, at least the way it hit me, it was just very different aesthetic and, and also kind of it felt like it was coming from a different place. So maybe it was the time, maybe it is a different place because it was, you know, bringing something from yep. <laughs> much earlier. Yeah. And I guess my other thing that kind of dovetails with Holly's work and yours and everybody else's, my wife, um, we were discussing um, on Sunday as my show was, my exhibition was ending and, and she was commenting about expressionism to me and she said you know those are your peeps those are the people that understand you more so than um, some of the folks who know you locally here and it was a great observation and holly kind of said the same thing earlier today is that we kind of get each other we were very different yeah. artists we're di very different people in in the modes of expression in one way, but there's something I think deep down in the core of our beings that we recognize in one another. And, and for me, that's been the power of this group. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I would not be able to probably talk about my work in the same way with just like a casual observer than with you guys, pretty much. Like it's a very different kind of thing. Yeah. I, I want to jump. I want. Excuse me. I want to. I want to jump. Jump in. It's like I have always been so taken by the impressionist movement, by the brotherhood of all of those artists who came together and they interacted and they talked and they each had their own vision, their own, their own style. But they were joined together and they supported each other. And the critiques and criticisms that they had, they worked together and that synergy made their creativity stronger. And that's what this group is doing. And yes, we are a 21st century movement and we're all over the world. And we aren't all together in Paris or in New York or in Chicago or whatever. And it is just so thrilling and exhilarating to be able to bounce off each other yes. our ideas and our work it's it's fantastic i completely agree a uh, painter ahmed Mr. okay i will definitely look these people up and that's, that's another thing too. I, I didn't actually mention that um, during the presentation, but <clears throat> during that kind of rapid experimentation period of mine, um, I was trying very hard not to necessarily reference anybody, not, not on purpose any, at least, because for all those years prior, I was constantly using references with what I was doing because I was making fan art or you know doing character, uh, gesture studies and stuff like that. So I was constantly referencing something else. And I was like, you know, I just want to reference me in myself. So let's see what that comes up with. And that's that drove a lot of what I did actually. So, um, Ooh, I just realized we only have four minutes left. <laughs> oh, okay. So um, I guess I can take like, or Holly can take like one quick question, comment. I got one for you, Davo. Is that right. one, that, is that picture that you um, had the childhood pictures of yourself, is that the only one that you've done that incorporates photography and digital drawing together or like any other? you know is that a modality that you'd like to 
expand upon in the future or is that sort of like a one-off uh, pictures i don't know um if if i wanted to do more i would have liked i would like to do more um like trying to like piece together from that time period that is essentially lost to me except in memories now um and i just i don't think i have enough source material for it is the thing and i think i do have like some pictures from my childhood that are still online like me with like a cat that i used to have and um one one picture that I really want to have, but I don't have it anymore. And it's actually a um, it's actually a poem here that kind of captures what it was. Let me try to find it real quick. Uh, where is it? But it was about um, my siblings and I. And geez, where'd it go? And oh, yeah, it was this one. Uh, this one on well here yeah this one um it was a picture with me my brother and my sister and we were all you know standing close together and you know looking like a family that's never going to happen again like i i i don't <laughs> um and i really wanted or was really hoping that you know someday that might come to pass but you know, the only way I could replicate that feeling or that imagery, again, is through something like this. So this is like the only reference that I have to that photo now, that memory, um, this poem. And a, a couple of the poems in here are kind of like that, because I don't have physical representations of a lot of that time anymore. All I have is my memories. And I don't know, but for something like that, so with the with those photos, I would rather have more like actual photos if I can find them to do. And it there might someone might have them somewhere in the family, but they're they probably don't talk to me anymore, or they probably don't want to talk to me. Um, but it could be something I try to hunt down and do later on if I if I get the chance. Because I know where some of these people live. I know they might. There's a chance that they have photos of um, myself when I was younger or my, uh, my siblings, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But at this time, yeah, it's kind of just a one-off thing <laughs> for now. Also, I think we lost Colin. I think he DC'd. Whoop. <laughs> I'm here. Oh, you, you dropped down or somebody else left. Because you were in the first row, now you're in the third row. Either way, um, yeah, we're, we're right at 4, 4 p.m. now, Eastern time. So I guess with that, um, that's, that's about it. Uh, you can definitely stay or stick around after um, the recording is finished to chat if you want to continue chatting. But the formal part of our text questions with Salon has now concluded. So very much thank you for being here and thank you for allowing me to take up so much of your time because I couldn't stop talking. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being a supportive part of the movement. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you all here. And thank you very much. And Tommy is showing off uh, his upcoming show, I think tomorrow. Yep. Or no, two days, September 30th. And yeah. Thursday, I hope to see everybody in the city. Yeah, or everyone that's in, in the York. city. Stop in, please. Yeah, everyone that's in New York, go, go hit up Tommy. <laughs> All right. It should be fun. Yeah. Thanks, Tava. No problem. Tommy, if you haven't already, definitely share the details for the opening and everything in the Facebook group. And yeah. I absolutely. Well, I'm waiting for the official thing to come out today. They're putting the PR together kind of last minute, but I'll, I'll share. I'll share everything. Fun to support. Uh, and you're you. you're going to be uh, the next salon presenting, I believe. Yep. I think so. From, from the gallery, Sydney hopefully. As well. Oh, we'll nice. That awesome. Nice. That, that'll be your first, I think. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And I hope to see you next time. I'll give you all a round of applause, I guess, because you all give me a round of applause. So I guess it's kind of going back and forth. But <laughs>
Thank you so much. And with that, that'll be it. Thank you. Everybody. <laughs>